are you on vacation and desperately want to catch up with the syllabus? Silao, sila. Don't fret because Joy Learning is giving you free extra classes not only on TV but on Zoom. Did you encounter any challenges with certain topics at school? Bring them here and we will help you get it solved with no sweat, Charlie. We are offering you a one-on-one teaching and learning opportunity with our award-winning TV teachers. Is it mathematics, general science, English language or any of the elective subjects that you have challenged? With. Meet our teachers for easy solutions. How do you join this free extra classes on Zoom? One, download the Zoom app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Two, create your username. Three, look for our Zoom meeting password on all our social media handles every week. And voila, you are good to join our virtual classroom from the comfort of your home. Make a date this Saturday with your facilitator at 12 noon prompt. The Joy Learning Teacher and you. I am so, so excited to be with you once again. Good evening to you all, our cherished viewers. And we are so sorry that we couldn't really start on time. It's another time for the revision show on the Joy Learning Television. And you can catch us live on YouTube, Joy Learning Television, or on Facebook, same Joy Learning Television. I am Annette Pabi Albert. You can call me Pius. And I'm so glad to come with your way tonight with a revision show in physics. So get on board, get a friend, get a relative informed that we are about looking at question number 12, the part two of the physics WASI paper. You've gone through questions number eight, number, eight, number nine, 10, 11. And this time we are on the last one, number 12 for the theory. And that is a sure bet that this year we are going to have questions under atomic and nuclear physics in the WASI exam. And so you have to stay with me here, get your pens, get the calculators ready. Let's try to revise the things we need to know under atomic and nuclear physics as we prepare for the exams. So just as I atomic and nuclear physics before we start up let us look at the problem of the day i'm going to make the show very very interactive such that i will give you a lot of opportunities to call in then we discuss we solve the questions together because they say practice makes perfect so let's look at the problem of the day first one says define radioactivity define radioactivity then it says beta, we should also define decay constant. Decay constant. So try and note the questions down if you have not seen them throughout the week before this time. So we are asked to define reactivity. Then we are also asked to define decay constant. Then we are asked to explain why the emission of a beta particle leads to the increase in the atomic number. Why the emission of a beta particle leads to the increase in the atomic number. Then, for the B part, we have some calculation to do. It says the half-life of radon is 3.80 days. Calculate the I decay constant in seconds. So take note, we are asked to find the decay constant in seconds. Then, we are asked to find the number of days it will take for radon to decay to one sixteenth of its original value. The number of days it will take radon to decay to one sixteenth of its original value. That's not all. Then, C says, 
a nucleus of hydrogen 3 is formed when a neutron is absorbed by a nucleus of hydrogen 2. Then, the table below gives masses of the particles in atomic mass unit, that is AMU. So you have particle, then you have the mass from the table. Then the first thing we are asked to do is to write a balanced equation for the reaction. Write a balanced equation for the reaction. Then we are asked again to calculate the energy released in this reaction. Calculate the energy released in this reaction. Then we'll be given some parameters. One atomic mass unit equals 1.7 times 10 to the power minus 27 kilogram. Then see which the speed of light in air, 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Good. So that is our problem of the day. I believe you've been able to capture what the problem of the day is. As we go along, I'm going to throw more light on how to solve this question. Then I'll give you the chance to call in so that we solve the question together. And I bet you, if you're able to do that, you will be rewarded. So for tonight's revision, we are beginning with something on atomic physics. And if time permits us, we'll go ahead and look at something and uh, nuclear physics. But as we solve the problem of the day two, we will run through atomic and nuclear physics. We start with line spectrum of an atom. And we are saying that a heated atom emits light of discrete wavelength. If I say discrete wavelength, I'm looking at specific or distinct wavelength. And these lines of specific wavelength, we call them the line spectrum. So what do we mean? I mean, you're trying to excite an atom. So you are hitting an atom here means you're trying to give the atom energy higher than the energy of the atom at its ground state. That also means that the electrons in the atom will also gain the energy that you give to the atom. Now, when electrons gain energy, what do they do? They become excited and then they make transitions. Electrons that gain energy would move from one energy level to the other. So from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. It could also happen that the electrons might be losing energy. In that case, that electron would move from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And as they make these transitions, Light is emitted. They give off some kind of uh, energy. When they are losing energy, they give off some. When they absorb energy too, you see some sparks being produced. And these emissions, we call them the line spectrum. And these line spectrums have discrete wavelength. They have a specific wavelength. So a particular electron making a transition from one level to the other we give up a line spectrum with a specific wavelength because it depends on the energy of the electron. It makes the transition. So let's move on. What are some of the characteristics of line spectrum? Number one, the lines are different for different elements. That is to say that depending on the element, that you have its electrons making transitions, the kind of line spectrum that we produced will be different. It differs from one element to the other. Number two, the lines are discrete, unique, and represent different energy levels. The lines are unique and they represent different energy levels. So when you see the line spectrum being produced, let's say an electron is moving from energy level one to two, 
that electron will give us a light spectrum which will be so different from one moving from energy level one to three. So the lines are discrete and represent different energy levels. Then the next one is that these lines are produced by gaseous atoms. These lines are produced by gaseous atoms. These are some of the characteristics of line spectrum. Now, I would like us to look at Bohr's postulates for the hydrogen atom. Because we are doing a recap, we are privileged to come across about three models of the atom. Thompson's model of the atom, looking at Rutherford's model of the atom, and then Bohr's model of the atom. Now, Bohr came out with some assumptions or postulates for his model of the atom. So let's look at the assumptions or the postulates made by Bohr as he brought us his model of the atom, trying to improve upon what others had done already. Now, the first one he said, electrostatic force of attraction between the electron and the nucleus provides the centripetal force to keep an electron moving in a circular orbit. What is he saying? He's saying that if you should pick an atom, let's say if this is the nucleus of an atom, So that's our nucleus. Inside this nucleus, protons and neutrons. Now, the neutron has no charge, but the proton has a positive charge. Then we are told that we have orbits around the nucleus. So these are orbits, just about two of them, where electrons go around the nucleus. So that could be an electron, it could be an electron. So these ones are electrons. So these electrons have a negative charge. So because the nucleus has protons, positive charge, neutrons, no charge, then the, the nucleus would take on the positive charges of the protons. Then you have the electrons with negative charges also orbiting around the nucleus, then we expect that there should be some, a force of attraction between them. That force of attraction between the electrons and the nucleus, which has a positive charge, is the Coulombic force. The Coulombic force. And Coulomb's law gives us an expression for that. But we are saying that this particular motion of the electrons around the nucleus is a circular motion. And if a body is undergoing circular motion, it will need centripetal force to enable it to complete or go through a circular motion. And Bohr is telling us that there is a force called electrostatic force. And according to him, that is an attractive force. And that is between the electrons and the nucleus. Why? Well, like charges attract. So this electrostatic force provides the centripetal force for the electron to keep going in a circular orbit. So assuming that maybe Fe is electrostatic force, and then Fc is centripetal force, then we can equate Fe to Fc. Why? Fe provides Fc. The electrostatic force provides the centripetal force and enables the electron 
to orbit, to move around the nucleus. Now, you can also look at this in another way. We, would be, we, can, we can write an expression for Fe because we are talking about electrostatic force here. And we are saying that the force between the, the two charges is Coulombic force. So we can equate that to Coulombic force. So in this case, it's the product of the charges divided by square the distance between them. Of course, there will be a constant. So if you are forgotten Coulomb's law, you can just go back and look at Coulomb's law and try to write an expression for Fe equals Fc. Fc will be, will be mv squared over r or m omega squared r, depending on the parameters that we have in the question. Now let's move on. Secondly, it says atoms have what we call stable states or stable orbits called stationary quantum states or allowed states or permissible states. And he said that in these states, electrons move without losing energy. Hence, the total energy of the atom remains constant. This is a response to why the atom is stable or the stability of the atom. If the electrons could be moving in orbit around the nucleus and it's such that they may be losing energy as they move, then there comes a point where they can get to the, maybe the last orbit before the nucleus and when they lose energy, they would crash into the nucleus and the atom rupture. But the atom doesn't rupture, it doesn't do that. So how come? And Bohr is explained to us that there are states we call stationary states or permissible states or allowed states. And when an electron finds itself in that state, it's able to go around, orbit the nucleus without losing energy. So that's one thing that you can Third one says that the angular momentum of an electron is quantized. So as the electron orbits the nucleus, it has an angular momentum. And according to him, the angular momentum is quantized. What does he mean? He, he says it is a positive integral multiple of h on 2 pi. Very soon we will look at what is h and then we can move on because we'll be using it a lot as we go on. So all he's saying is that if you find an electron orbiting the nucleus and you want to find its angular momentum, it's, it is an integral multiple, positive integral multiple of h on 2 pi. That is to say, angular momentum is equal to n times h on 2 pi. What's n? n is called the principal quantum number. Principal quantum number. So depending on where the electron is, the, the, the orbit, the level of the electron, if it is just at the first orbit, then n could be 1. If it's at the second, n could be 2. Third, n could be 3. And then it continues. So n could be 1, 2, 3, and then it continues. Now, h is a Planck's constant. And the value mostly will be given to you in the question. So he's saying that from n equals, from angular momentum equals n times h on 2 pi. And an equation for the angular momentum. Angular momentum. is mvr. So we can then say mvr is equal to n times h on 2 pi. You see where we are heading towards? So 
M here is the mass of the electron. So try and see if you get some expressions for angular momentum depending on the orbit in which the electron is found. So for the first stationary state of a orbit n equals 1. So when n is equal to 1, then you have mvr is equal to n times h on 2 pi. So mvr will give us 1 times h on 2 pi, which is the same as mvr equals h on 2 pi. That's what we mean. So in case you have n equals 2, then you're going to get mvr equals n times h on 2 pi. You put 2 place of n there. That gives us mvr equals 2 times h on 2 pi. Then we cancel out. Get mvr equals h on pi. So he says that the angular momentum of the electron in orbit around the nucleus is quantized. It's an integral of positive integral multiples of h on 2 pi. So when you find where the electron is at the orbit or in, on the orbit, then the number of that orbit multiply it by h on 2 pi, and you are going to get the angular momentum. That is simply that. Then the fourth one, which I have so much interest in, it says electromagnetic radiation or energy is emitted by the hydrogen atom when an electron jumps. So I've put jumps in inverted comments. Not necessarily like jumps, but like it makes transitions. It moves from one point or from one energy level to the other. This from a higher energy level to a lower energy level or vice versa. So all he's saying is that each time an electron makes a transition from either a higher energy level to a lower one, or from a lower energy level to a higher one, there is an emission of energy, electromagnetic radiation. And so sometimes we say you see spectral lines in the atom when the electrons make transitions. So whenever you have electrons moving from higher to a lower or lower to a higher energy level, they give off electromagnetic radiations. That is a very important postulate. Now, he goes ahead to tell us something that is more interesting. He says that the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation emitted is related to the change in the atom's energy. So he's saying that as the electrons move or they make transitions, and they give off some energy, there's a change in energy of the atom. And he said that the frequency of these radiations relate to the change in energy by the expression change in energy, change in E is equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency. This is a very important relationship that is going to help us to do a number of calculations. So let's look at what we can do with this particular relation. We are told that change in energy. So we can look at a change in energy change in energy. So the electron can occupy a lower energy level and move to a higher, or can be at a higher energy level and move to a lower. So let's use maybe EI and EF to represent energy at the initial level, energy at the final level. So if I have EI, I mean energy at initial level, and I have EF, I mean energy. 
at final level. Therefore, the change in energy could be either energy at the initial level minus that at the final level. So EI minus EF if and only if EI is greater than EF. Or the change in energy can be equal to EF minus EI if and only if EF is greater than E i very important so that will be for the change in energy now the formula for the speed of light in air when you dealt with wave phenomenon it said v is equal to f lambda velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength in this case the velocity or the speed of light in air we are using c to represent it we can say from C is equal to F times wavelength. So F is the frequency. So C here is speed of light. In this case, the radiation, a method in air or vacuum. At this level, we just say air or vacuum, although there's, so, there's a distinction there. Then this is giving me the wavelength. If we make F the subject, then F frequency becomes C on wavelength. So I would like to substitute all that into the expression for change in energy. Then it means that a change in energy can be equal to hc on lambda hc on lambda we can get so i have change in energy hc on lambda but i think it could be ei minus ef so it could be ei minus ef is equal to hc on lambda or EF minus EI equals HC on lambda. This is very important. It's going to help us to solve for a number of things. So we could find the wavelength, we could find the frequency, we could find the change in energy when the electron makes transitions. We could find the change in energy of the atom and this is a very important relationship which you have to take note of. Good. So now we can go ahead and apply what we have learned right now to try and solve some questions. Now, this example one is a past question. Those days it was senior secondary school certificate examination. 2003, question number 10, A, I, I, I. Let's take our time, look at the question and see if I, or when I'm able to solve a question or two, then we will open the phone lines and ask you to also call in and try your hands on something I'm going to give you. So you pay attention, please, so that we solve this together. Then the next one together. Then the next one, my viewers will be given that opportunity to call in and also make input. So the first question says that, calculate the energy of an electromagnetic radiation of wavelength 3.0 times 10 to the power minus 4 meters. Then we'll be given the value of the Planck's constant, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 4 joule second. Sometimes it could be given as 6.63 times 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. You have to stick to the value given to you in the question, right? So don't just put the value in your head and say, I'm going to use it. No. Look at what is given to you in the question and then use that. Then the speed of light in air is 3.0 times in the power 8 meters per second. So how do we go about this? So I have a suggested solution. Let's try to see what we can do. From the question, we are asked to find 
the energy of the atom. So I'll say energy is equal to E. Now, what have we been given? We'll be given the wavelength. So the wavelength. Lambda has been given the question. The value is there. What do we need? From the formula, it says E. We'll also be given C. So let's say speed of light. Or speed of the radiation. In air is C. So E says E is equal to HC on lambda. That's very simple. And that's what we want. We want E. So E will give us our H is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 3, 4, all times the C, 3.0 times 10 to the power 8. Then it says on the wavelength. So over 3.0 times 10 to the power minus 4. And you have to be very careful here. Make sure that your, your calculator is at the right mode, the degree mode, and then you try to compute that. And try uh, to avoid approximations, okay? So try to compute everything carefully as a go like that. And let's see what you're going to get. So I have my answer ready. And it says I'm going to get 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 22. So I have 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 22. Now, if I leave the answer like this, there's a problem. Why? We are asked to find energy. We have to attach the unit for energy, which is Joe. So, Joe. That becomes our answer. This is quite simple. And straightforward. Pick your formula E is equal to HC on lambda. There. And E is already a subject. You put in the parameters, you have your answer. Let's try the next question. Example. We should be having the numbers on our screen shortly so that. After this example, you should be able to call in and try your hands on the next example. And let's see. Okay, it's also a past question. Wasi 2006, question 15C. It says, an electron jumps from an energy level of minus 1.6 electron volts to one of minus 10.4 electron volts in an atom. Calculate the I energy of the emitted radiation. Then I, I says, wavelength of the emitted radiation. Then we've been given some parameters. H is equal to 6.6 .6 and 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. And C is there. And then 1 EV equals 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19. Now, note that in this question, we've been given energy energies at the energy levels. And the units are EV, electron volt. In atomic physics, you could be given the a value for energy and a unit of energy is in electron volts. Now, if you are not given the conversion, which in this case we have been given, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. If you are not been given the conversion, then you are likely to leave your answer in electron volts and you will not be penalized. But if you are given the conversion, then you have to change and get your answer in joules. So let's look at how we go about solving this. So in the question, we've been told that the electron is making a transition, check it, from one level minus 1.6 EV to one of minus 10.4 EV. We are looking at the negative attached to the value. So in this case, the minus 1.6 EV will be a higher energy level than the minus 10.4 EV. So as we try to solve, let's try and put down 
the energy levels. So I have something like this and that. And I have one to be minus 1.6. So this may be energy at the initial level. Minus 1.6 EV. Then energy at the final level. Minus 10.4 EV. So the electron makes that transition. Jumps this way. Like that. Good. Then we are asked to find energy of the emitted radiation. In other words, the change in energy. So energy of emitted radiation, maybe that. So I'll say change in energy is equal to E I minus E F. We are good to go. So what are E I? So I have minus 1.6. Don't forget they are in electron volts. So minus then minus 10.4. So, minus 1.6, so it becomes minus 1.6 plus 10.4. And that gives us 8.8. .8. So, I have 8.8 .8 electron volts. But that is the reason why we've been given 1 EV is equal to 1.6 times the power minus 19 joules. Therefore, we multiply our answer, it becomes a change in energy, it becomes. 8.8 .8 times 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19. And when you do that, so times 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19, and that gives me 1.408. So 1.408 times 10 to the power minus 18. And this time, it's in joules. 1.408 times the power minus 18 joules. So, it's quite a simple one. You look at the energy levels, where it's coming from and where it's going. And then you use our formula. It says the change in energy is that of the initial minus final. If the energy at the initial level is higher than or greater than that at the final level. Or we do it the other way around. Then, the question goes ahead and asks us to find the wavelength of the emitted radiation. So, I'm going to look at maybe the I, I part. This could be the I part. So, I have wavelength, which is lambda. So, wavelength of the emitted radiation. Now, how do we solve that? Our formula says change in energy equals Hc on wavelength. So, we can make wavelength the subject. To get wavelength equals Hc on change in energy. And lucky for us, we have just solved for the change in energy. So, we have the, to have the value to put it there. We're given the Planck's constant, and we have the C also given. So wavelength becomes 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power minus 3.4 times 3.0 times 10 to the power 8. Then we divide all that by our answer for change in energy, which is 1.408 times 10 exponent minus 18. If we do that very well, then we're going to get an answer to be 1.406 times 10 to the power minus 7. We are not through. I take my time to talk about these things because most of the times students make this mistake. Maybe exams pressure, they are in a hurry, they want to beat time. They write the values, they calculate everything correctly. 
then leave the unit out, which is very bad. So we are looking at wavelength. What will be our unit? Meter. And so 1.406 times 10 to the power minus 7. Then we add meter or meters to it. That becomes our wavelength. So at this juncture, it's a good time for you to try your hands on what I have on your screen. And you should be able to have the call number or the phone lines on your screen now so you can call in and contribute. It's a revision show and we are trying to do the revision together. So this will stay on your screen for a while. I think I'll take a breather, take a short break. Look at the question. Let me take you to the question first. I'll take a break and then we come back and see who has a solution to offer. A diagram above illustrates the energy levels for a certain atom. So you can see that this is what we call an energy level diagram, where usually to your left hand side, you have Cantor numbers. So an anomalous circumstance, you should have something like maybe n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. On the left hand side. Then on your right hand side, you have the energies that come with those or that are associated with those levels. Now, so we call it an energy level diagram. It gives you a, 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 a diagram that gives you counting numbers on your left hand side, energy levels or energies with the levels at the right hand side. And the change in energy between successive levels decreases, decreases as the counting numbers increase. So for an energy level diagram, as the counting numbers increase, the change in energy decreases. Now, sometimes in wide exams, students are given a diagram for the energy level, and then they are asked to copy that diagram and do some work. Now, note that the distance between the lines or the distances between the lines are not constant. They are not the same. Look at the distance between E0 and E1. Look at E1 and E2. Look at E2 and E3. These distances are not the same. I've seen that in some of the textbooks, and you have to be careful. So as you ask to draw, make sure that you don't give same spacing between the lines, because it's not so. The change in energies decrease as the counting numbers increase. And you can look at that on your screen. So we are asked to do one or two things. The first one says, which of the transitions A, B, and C produces radiation with the shortest wavelength? Give a reason for your answer. So you're looking at transition A, B, and C. Which of them is going to give you radiation of the shortest wavelength? Of the shortest wavelength. Then it goes ahead to say we should do another thing. The same diagram is there. In the first case, we are asked to find out which of them, A, B, C, will give us radiation of the shortest wavelength. This one says an electron jumps from E0 to E2 by absorbing light energy. So from the diagram, you can see E0, and you can see to E2. So we are talking about this part of the diagram, that part. Then you are asked to calculate the wavelength of the light used. Hmm. The wavelength of the light used. You will be giving Planck's constant, and be giving speed of light in air, you'll be giving 1 EV equals 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. We will take a short break here. When we come back, I will be expecting your call. Try your hands on this, and let's hear from you. Let's take a breather from now, and let's hear from you as we...
on vacation and desperately want to catch up with the syllabus, Silao Silla. Don't fret because Joy Learning is giving you free extra classes not only on TV but on Zoom. Did you encounter any challenges with certain topics at school? Bring them here and we will help you get it solved with no sweat, Charlie. We are offering you a one-on-one teaching and learning opportunity with our award-winning TV teachers. Is it mathematics, general science, English language or any of the elective subjects that you have challenges with? Meet our teachers for easy solutions. How do you join these free extra classes on Zoom? One, download the Zoom app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Two, create your username. Three, look for our Zoom meeting password on all our social media handles every week. And voila, you are good to join our virtual classroom from the comfort of your home. Make a date this Saturday with your facilitator at 12 noon prompt. The Joy Learning teacher and you, we don't stop learning. Joy Learning, keep learning. is two years. Oh, how time flies. Today I have been a benefactor and students in this country and beyond are also benefactors. We appreciate even how you handled the inconveniences that came with the lockdown with the COVID, even helping students to learn even in their homes. So with your two years anniversary, we say congrats and keep up the good work you are doing. We wish you success in the future. And I know that Ghanaians are expecting more from you. Two might sound very similar in a way, but Joy Lane has done a lot. And on this note, I would want to wish Joy Lane a happy two-year anniversary. The whole country is now into it. They are watching Joy Learning, they are learning. So I would only say that it should continue and it should work harder than before. I hope that many more students will find it not just as an appendix, but as an integral part of their learning experiences. Let's encourage our wards or our kids to watch Joy Learning so they learn something better because day in, day out, new things are being taught. For mathematics in particular, I look forward to the day when because of Joy Learning and every other such intervention, mathematics would not be feared. It would be revered, respected, loved. I mean, the kind of subject that you don't run away from when you hear it, but you embrace it. Joy Learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Just a click away on your phone, tablet, and computer. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Joy Learning TV and watch our recorded lessons. The Revision Show is now live on Joy Learning TV, on your multi TV digital box, and on Facebook at Joy Learning TV. Every for updates on our educative programs as well as fun concepts, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Joy Learning TV and on Instagram at Official Joy Learning TV. Joy Learning. Keep learning. The time is up for the Joy Learning Revision Show. The time is up for our dear final year senior high school learners to start preparing for their final year WASI. And as always, our TV teachers are ever ready to take you through your revision sessions on Ghana's first ever educational TV channel, Joy Learning. Presenting to you Word Problems in Mathematics. The SHS Revision Show is coming with a new segment called The Question of the Day. And students who will answer the specific subject questions correctly will be rewarded. Dear final year learners, don't be left out of this year's SHS Revision Show every Monday to Friday at 7.30 p.m. And remember to tell a friend to tell a friend that the time is up for the Revision Show. As sellers are going into the market, the profit margins will be falling. Starting on Monday, 13th June 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Joy learning, keep learning.
All right, it's good to be back. Welcome back. The calling line number is 030 2211 705. 030 So I'm right here waiting for your call. I'm sure you tried your hands on the question. So we have a question. It should be showing on your screen pretty shortly. And let me hear from you what you did about it. We are asked to tell which of these transitions, A, B, and C, will produce radiation with the shortest wavelength. Then we are asked to give a reason. So you don't just say transition A, B, or C, but afterwards, you should be able to tell why that is so why that is so so zero three zero two two one one seven zero five or zero three zero two two one one seven zero six then we are good to go then when we are through we will look at the second part of the question too we will get that done we are asked that if the electron jumps from e0 to e2 so it's like i have highlighted here by absorbing light energy we are asked to calculate the wavelength of the light used that one through find time work on this then we get back on track so as i wait i'll continue with some technologies now as far as atomic physics is concerned there are some technologies that we use and i would like us to take time and go through some of these technologies the first one you have is the stationary state what do we mean by stationary state I think this is an orbit where an electron moves around the nucleus without losing or absorbing energy in the form of radiation. So there's a particular state. Okay, I have a caller on the line. Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Who is on the line, please? Shakina. Come again. Shakina. Shakina. Yes, please. Please, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Kumasi. Okay, Shakina, go ahead. I'm listening to you. If my answer is okay, six point six times ten, six point six minus nineteen five. Oh yeah, Shakina. Can you please lower the volume of your TV set so that we can hear you well? Okay, we are getting a feedback from here. Okay. So I can listen from the phone, right? Okay. You were asked to tell which transition will give us the shortest wavelength, okay? Yes. So not get the value. You just tell us the transition. Is it, is it going to be A, B, or C? Um, I C. Come again. C. Good, perfect, that's correct. Transition C. But do you have a reason why will it be C? Um, okay, I appreciate your call. Okay, thank you so much for calling. Thank you, Shakina. We have Joseph on the line. Hello, Joseph. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Joseph. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Please, uh, I want to thank you for the gift delivered to me. Oh, you're welcome, Joseph. Tonight, do you have something to tell us? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead, Joseph. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Agon Kwanta. Agon Kwanta. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Okay, um, the I, I have my answer to be transition C. Okay, that's good. Which is the good. And my reason, my reason is um, the transition will produce the highest energy. That is the, uh, the highest energy, yeah. All right. That is perfect. That is perfect. Thank yes, you, please. Joseph from Gonan Quanta, for calling in. Keep watching the show, right? I am I'm happy that our first two callers are right on point. From the data that we have, transition C will have or will produce radiation with the shortest wavelength. So, in an attempt to solve the question, we will say, I transition C transition C 
That's good. What is the reason? Now, I'm going to say hello. Your first answer. Hello. Yes, now I'm going to say good evening. Can you please lower the volume of your TV set? I can't hear you, please. Okay, Joseph, on the line. Hello, Joseph. Yeah. I want, I want to answer the second question. The second okay, part. okay, we can go on. The second okay, question, so I have it. Um, we are asked to uh, calculate the wavelength of the light to So can I go through the step or I should just voice out the answer? Oh, I would like to know how come you are getting your answer. So if you want us okay. to go through, we can go through. So we have the wavelength to be there. H T over E. Okay. When H is a time constant and then uh, we have the C to be the speed of light, and then the E to be the energy. Okay, let's go ahead. So, if the electron, if the electron jump from uh, energy level, uh, the lowest energy to energy level two. Okay. You have uh, so the difference in this energy, which is which is going to give you a relation of uh, wavelength to be equal to H C all over E two minus E E naught. Okay. So uh, when you bring in the values, you get lambda to be equal to six times six times ten raised to the power negative thirty-four times three times ten raised to the power eight, which is the speed of light. Okay, that's good. All over in the bigger bracket, you have negative five point six. Okay. Minus into bracket negative okay. fifteen point four, which is the E naught. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, going for that, uh, lambda to be 6.6 times 10 to the power negative 34 okay. times 3 times 10 to the power 8 okay. all over. When you uh, work out the ones in the bucket, which is the denominator, you get uh, 9.8 times 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19, okay. which is the, the plan constant. Okay. Go ahead. So, the final answer, you get 1.3. Times 10 this to the power negative 7 meters. Okay. Since we're asked to calculate the wavelength of the light used. Okay. So, our final answer to be 1.3 times 10 to the power negative 7 meters. Thank you, Joseph. That is correct. Excellent. Okay. We appreciate your call, Joseph. Thank you for calling. Hello, Nalan Ponsa. Hello. Yeah, good evening, Nalan Ponsa. Oh, I think we've lost Nalan Ponsa. So Joseph has taken us through the solution for the second part of the question. And he's right on point. He gave us the formula to use wavelength equals HC on E. Here, E should be, I think it should be a change in energy. Correct? And he said that the transition is from E to E naught from the diagram, from E naught to E2. So the change in energy, he saying it says, E2 minus E0, like that. E2 minus E0, because E2 is higher than E0. So you have the values put in there, plus constant, speed of light, in, or radiation in air. Then, very important here, that is one point that students normally miss it. Here, because you have a negative value minus another negative value, it becomes a positive value here. So be very careful when working. This side it becomes minus 5.6 plus 15.4, and when you evaluate that, you get 1.263 times in the power minus 7. So, same as 1.3 times in the power 7. Okay, I have a caller. Hello, boss man. Hello, sir. Is it Osman? Osman. Ooh. Okay, Osman. Good yes. evening. Good evening. How are you doing well, my brother? Yes, sir. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Kumasi. Okay, Osman, what do you have for us? He said... What do you have for us tonight? Yeah, the second question. Okay. Um, The one that the boy initially did. Okay. The change in energy. Okay. I multiplied the value okay. by... Um, you see, it, um, if you calculate the change in energy, it's mm -hmm. going to be an electron volt. Good. Yeah, so I multiplied it 
by the um you see in the question they give one ev is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19. exactly yes yeah, so i multiply it by it to get it in joules good then i substituted it back into the question okay yeah so my final answer i had 1.263 times 10 raised to the power negative 7 meters good good exactly so osman you've done a yo mass job thank you very much okay yes sir. you've done very well thank you for calling in and keep watching right okay sir yeah i am so glad that my listeners are getting things right on point so i was just about going there that the energies have been given to us in electron volts so from what we have here 6.6 times 10 to the power minus 3 4 times 3 times 10 to the power 8 all over the change in energy we have bigger bracket minus 5.6 minus into bracket minus 15.4 now when you evaluate this just multiply it by 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 okay so when you do that right at the onset your final answer will be in joules and that will give us what osman gave us 1.263 times 10 to the power minus 7 meters let's quickly look at why joseph's answer is also correct for the first one Check it. We are asked to find which transition will give us one with the shortest wavelength. He said C. So he picked out transition C. Then we asked him, or we were asked to give a reason for the answer. And he said the reason is that transition C will produce the highest change in energy. Transition C. will produce the highest change in energy. The highest change in energy. So what has the change in energy got to do with the wavelength? Then we go to our formula. Our formula says, so what is our proof? You don't need to prove this in the exams, but because you are learning, you need to know. It says that the change in energy is equal to hc on wavelength so you can see that okay joseph hello joseph hello sir. yes joseph you're back again okay sir um please uh, can i can i state uh i want to prove the reason why the transition c will produce the highest energy perfect let's go ahead okay so um we have the energy to be hc over lambda good okay so the change in uh, energy will be e C subscript H minus C subscript L is equal to H C over lambda. Okay. So the um we have lambda to be equal to H C over E subscript H minus E subscript L. Okay. So um for transition A, we have lambda is equal to H C over negative ten point one okay. minus into bracket negative 15.4 okay which will give you hc over 5.3 okay that's for transition a okay then we have transition b okay. which will give you lambda is equal to hc that's from the diagram yeah over negative 5.6 minus into bracket negative 15.4 okay. and that also give you hc over 9.8 okay then transition C, we have lambda is equal to H C all over negative three point three minus into bracket negative fifteen point four. Okay. And that will also give you H C over twelve point one. So okay. um when you look at the energy, the one that will produce the highest energy, that will be transition C. Okay. That is the reason why transition C will have the shortest wavelength. Good. Good. What is good, Joseph? question you have go tasku yeah that's impressive i applaud you tonight you've really done a yo job thank you so much for contributing
All right, so from the formula, change in energy equals HC on wavelength, the change in energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Therefore, the higher the change in energy, the shorter the wavelength. So if he said that the reason for which transistivity will give us the shortest wavelength is because it to produce the highest change in energy. That is true. And he has called in to do just that. If you pick the numerator to be HC, 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 they are constants. Now what is changing is the change in energy. And he's done it for A, you're going to get 5.3 electron volt for B, 9.8 and for C, 12.1 electron volt. So this is going to give us the highest change in energy. And because change in energy is inversely proportional to wavelength, this one will produce the shortest wavelength. Bravo, Joseph. I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you for, for, for being with us on the revision show. There are greater things to come. So we will go ahead and look at the, uh, the technologies and then we will then move on to other things. Don't forget we have the problem on the day which shortly we'll be looking at. So thank you. Keep watching. Keep learning. So we were on, I think the next one was ground state. Ground state. Ground state. We were looking at stationary state at first. We said an orbit where electrons move around the nucleus without losing or absorbing energy in the form of radiation. Then you go on to what you call the ground state. The ground state is the lowest stationary energy state of an atom. And at this state, electrons have the lowest energy. Electrons have the lowest energy at this state, at the ground state. Now, we are saying that the ground state, at the ground state, an electron there is occupying the energy level that corresponds to quantum number n is equal to 1. So if I'm asked to find the energy of the electron at the ground state, I have to know that n is equal to 1. Now, the atom is most stable at the ground state. The atom is most stable at the ground state. Hello, Joseph. Um, uh, I want to try the problem of the day. You want to try the problem of the day? Yeah. Okay, which of them? Um, I think all of them. All of them? Yes, please. Wow. Okay, so in that case, let's quickly move on to the problem of the day and let's see what Joseph has to give okay, us. Sir. Okay, okay, so I think the first question yeah, is talking about we should question. define something. Yeah, radioactivity. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, so um, radioactivity is a continuous disintegration or decay of an unstable nucleus okay. with the emission of radiation and the release of energy to form a new stable nucleus. Okay. Okay, so that's what they call radioactivity. Yeah. Okay, let's we move have on. the decay constant. Okay. So the decay constant is the time rate of disintegration per unit nucleus of a radioactive element at an instant. Okay. Okay. Then uh, the I I we ask we ask to explain why emission of beta particles leads to, to the increase in the atomic number. Okay. Okay. Please, please, uh, I want us to have a representation. A representation. So, um, if we have capital big X with sub uh, superscript A and subscript Z. Okay. Which giving us to Y big Y. Okay. Superscript A. Subscript B plus one plus the beta particle with superscript zero and subscript negative one. So, uh, um, the answer is saying that uh, beta particle is produced as a result of uh, changing excess neutrons into protons and 
the total number of nucleus in both the parent and daughter are the same. Okay. As you can see from the diagram. Okay. Uh, the reaction shows that the parent nucleus has eight mass, mass number, which is A, at the superscript, unchanged. That is the nucleus. The nucleus has its mass number unchanged, but the atomic number Z increased by one. Okay. And when beta particle is produced, it leads to an increase in atomic number okay. from the diagram. Okay. So, and then the next question. All right. So you are asked you, uh, I think, so I can look the question. Said the half-life of radon is... Yeah, we'll be giving the half-life of uh, radon. Yes, please. Um, yeah, ask to calculate the decay constant. 3.30 Yeah. Uh, and you we'll ask to calculate the decay constant. Yes, but in seconds. In seconds. Okay. Okay. So, um, we have the decay constant. So, first of all, we need to find the, uh, the, okay, the decay constant. So, we have the half-life to be 3.80 days. Okay. So, what are you going to use to present the, the half-life? Um, what will you use to represent the half life? The half life, yeah. yes. We have a capital T subscript one on T. Okay, fine. And T subscript half. Okay. This is equal to 3.80 days. Okay. okay. So we have the decay constant, which is lambda, is equal to 0 0.693 okay. all over the half life. Okay. So we have lambda to be equal to 0 0.693 all over 3.80. Okay. okay. Then we have, um, so we are having 0 0.182 seconds. Okay. Okay. Second. Okay, so uh, the I I you are asked to determine the number of days it will take for radon to decay to one sixteenth of the original value. Yes. Yeah, I think that's the question, right? That's the question, yeah. Okay. So we have um N which is the uh, if we just if we don't decay to one sixteenth of its original value. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have n to be capital N to be equal to n not e superscript negative lambda times t. Why is lambda? So we have lam lambda superscript. Okay. Negative uh, lambda times t. Times t. t yeah, that's the time. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, if we don't decrease to one sixteenth of its original value n naught, then it means that n will be equal to one out of sixteen times n naught. Okay. So uh, when we substitute into the equation, we will have one over sixteen n naught is equal to n naught e to pass with negative lambda t. Okay. So, uh, you see, we have a common, uh, a common, uh, how do you call it? A common term on so both sides. Not, and not is uh, common. Okay. okay. So they will cancel out. Okay. So we have uh, 1 over 16 is equal to um, E to pass with negative lambda on T. Uh, okay. And T. Okay. Okay, okay so... Um, so when we cross multiply, we get 16 is equal to e of the e neg uh, superscript negative lambda t. When we change it, you get 1 over 16 is equal to 1 over e superscript lambda t. Now the negative will go up. Okay. Uh, so when you cross multiply that, you get two fractions. So when you cross multiply, you get 16 is equal to e lambda superscript lambda times t. Okay. Okay, so um, when we take uh, len on both sides, okay. we get uh, len 16 is equal to 
the lambda t, which uh, the e there will go off. Then we take ln on both sides. Okay. So we get ln 16 is equal to lambda times t. All right. So uh, when we make t the subject, you get t to be equal to ln 16 all over lambda. All right. And you know, um, lambda to be 0 0.182. So what? Uh, t is equal to 2.77 all over 0 0.182. Okay. And that would give us, uh, that would give us 15.2 days. Okay. Right. Days. Okay. And uh, so this is the last question. Yeah, so we look at the last question. Okay, so the last question, uh, that, that one was the table, was in the table form. Yeah, you have it on the screen now. Okay, so we were asked to write a balanced equation for the reaction. Yes. Okay, so um, we have the balance, I have the balanced equation to be um, capital okay. H, which is hydrogen. Come again. Come again. And the substrate to be one. So, okay. Plus, two, we have one. neutrons, which is the superscript to be one, and the substrate to be zero. Uh -huh. And that will give you hydrogen with superscript three and substrate one. Okay. Plus energy. Your energy will be released. Good. That's perfect. Then we have the II. So, if you calculate the energy released in this reaction, Okay. So the energy released at I, we are going to calculate the value of it. Okay. So, yeah. so because of our time, can you uh, tell me the procedure and then give me the final answer? Okay, no problem. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we, let them, we have a mass defect. So, uh, we have the mass defect to be changed in M. So what is the formula you're going to use for this particular question? Which formula are you going to use? Okay. The formula that I'm going to use will be E is equal to... So, take a time. Like e is equal to... Uh -huh. E is equal to change in M C squared. Okay, good. We are going to use Einstein uh, atomic... Uh, mass energy equation. equation. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, can I start? Yeah, let's start. Okay, so the mass defect, which is changing M, okay. is equal to when big bracket, we have hydrogen with superscript 2 and subscript 1 plus the neutron with superscript 1 and subscript 0, bracket close. Okay. Minus into bracket hydrogen with superscript 1, uh, 3, and subscript 1. Okay. Okay, so um, from the table, we're giving um, that for the hydrogen to be, the mass of hydrogen to be 2.00141. Yeah. Plus that of the neutron to be 1.00867. Okay. Bracket code minus another bracket. We have three point zero zero one six zero bracket close. Okay. Okay, so when you um when you go about it, you get um zero point zero zero eight four eight U, which is the uh, the unit. 0.0.0048U. Okay. Okay, so we have, um, we're in the question, we're giving uh, 1 U to be 1.7 times 10 raised to 4, negative 27 kilograms. Good. So we we'll multiply that one. So we have okay. uh, the answer, which is 0 0.00848 times. 1.7 times 10 raised to the power negative 27 kilogram. Okay. So the final answer will be 1.4416.
times 10 years the power negative 29 kilogram. Okay. So we are now coming to the energy release, which is E because we change in MC squared. Okay. So we have E to be now, we know the change in energy. Uh, sorry, we know the change in M. Okay. That is 1.4416 times 10 to the power negative 29. Okay. Multiplied by the speed of light squared. So we have into bracket 3.0 times 10 raised to the power 8 all squared. Okay. So then when you resolve it, you will get your final answer to be 1.3 times 10 raised to the power negative 12 joules. All right. It's okay. been an interesting journey, Joseph. <laughs> yeah. So to save your credit, let me say thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, sir. Your name, you see, you are Joseph and you are from Tar School, right? You are attending Tarasina High School. Thank we are grateful for watching. We are going to contact you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for watching and thank you, viewers, for being with us. Joseph tonight has really taken us on a journey. With the problem of the day, he's done justice to almost every part of the question. And I'm going to walk you through it little by little. Only the, I think, the first part that we have a little hitch here and there. Here and there. But I'll walk you through that one too. And then we look at what we can go, go do. So let's look at right from the onset. We we're asked to do some definitions. Wow, I'm impressed. That, that's, that's very good, Joseph. That's very good. We we're asked to first define radioactivity. You will bear with me that when it comes to radioactivity, you could have natural radioactivity, and you could also have induced radioactivity. So I think that to be on a safer side, when you are asked to define radioactivity, try to incorporate both natural and induced. So we would say radioactivity is either the spontaneous or induced. In that case, I've taken natural or induced. This integration of an unstable or stable nucleus. So if the nucleus is unstable, then it will disintegrate or split by itself. But if it is stable, then you have to induce it by bombarding it with, let's say, a neutron. Then it will disintegrate. So we are saying it is the spontaneous or induced disintegration of an unstable or stable radioactive isotope with the emission of. So here we want to look at what are the kind of particles or radiations that will be emitted when there is radioactivity. We are saying alpha particle, beta particle, and then gamma radiations. Then, very important, there will also be the production of energy. Then that nucleus or radioisotope that disintegrated will form one that is more stable. So you could have this as our definition of Reactivity, the spontaneous or induced disintegration of an unstable nucleus or stable reactive isotope with the emission of alpha, beta, and gamma radiations, which produces energy and a more stable isotope. So, thank you, Joseph. We ha just have to do a little polishing to the definition you gave us, and we are good to go. Then we are asked to define. Decay constant. And you are saying that this is the rate of decay per unit number of radioactive isotopes present at a given time. The rate of decay per unit number of radioactive isotopes present at a given time. And that could give us the decay constant. So that one was okay. Now we move on to this one. It says explain why the emission of a beta particle. So we have Beta particle emitted, and it leads to an increase in atomic number. So, what are we saying? I say that the emission of an alpha, or let's say a beta particle, due to, is due to the conversion of a neutron into a proton. So, in this case, you have a conversion, a neutron into a proton. And therefore, there will be a gain in the atomic number. Why? Because now a neutron has been turned into a proton. 
but then there will not be a change in the mass number. So when you have a beta particle emitted, it is due to a conversion of a neutron into a proton. So there will be an increase in the number of protons, the atomic number, but then there will not be a change in the mass number. That one is okay from Joseph's answer. But we have a little problem here. Here, we're asked to find the decay constant in seconds, okay? But the half-life of radon is in days. This is where I think Joseph has to uh, polish what he did a little bit. It's good we have the half-life. We have the formula which says our uh, decay constant lambda is lean to on the half life okay so we don't have a problem with the formula he gave it to us in two the same as 0 0.693 but the problem is that we have been given 3.80 days that is the problem and we have to change we need the answer in seconds so what do we do 3.80 we change to hours 24 hours in a day so we need to multiply our 3.80 by 24 i'm trying to get you a step-by-step -step approach this one will give us the value in hours so we get into 1.2 hours now we change this one in hours to minutes 16 minutes we get one hour. So I'm going to get 91.2 times 60. And that should give you 5, 4, 7, 2. And this time we have it in minutes. Now, 60 seconds will give us one minute. So we want to change from now minutes to seconds. We're going to get 5, 4, 7, 2 times 60 again. And that gives us 3. Two eight three two zero seconds. So if you are watching Joseph, you realize that the value for the half life in seconds will be three two eight three zero seconds. So in that case, the k constant will become zero point six nine three over. 328320. And that answer should be 2.11 times 10 to the power minus 6 per second. Because it is that over that. That over that. So, uh, Joseph, I hope you are watching and all of you too. We should be able to obey the rudiments of the question. So they say in seconds. So that is the reason why I circled this place and I put a red asterisk there that we have to take a look at this. But you were very good at all that you have done. You had the equations correct, putting the values. We only had an issue with this. So that is okay for the problem of the day. That's good. Then we move ahead and look at what we did for. Finding the number of days to take radon to decay to one sixteenth of its original value. And the answer is just perfect. It's just perfect. It's just perfect. It's just perfect. So we have number of days, and there is another way we could also solve the same question. Joseph has taken us through n equals n naught. Hello? Hello there. It's Joseph again? Yes, please. Okay, what do you have to tell us, Joseph? Welcome back. Oh, um, I was about to, uh, the II, okay. the, the decay constant for the radon. Okay. Yeah, I was about to do, uh, correct myself, but you've already done it, so that, I think that, that's correct. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much, Joseph. I appreciate it. Okay. So, he took us through the solution, N equals N0E. The power minus lambda t. That's what we need. 
and then we walk through that and it's quite comprehensive so we say n equals one sixteenth of the original value original value is the n naught so one sixteenth of n naught so you can get one sixteenth of, of n naught equals n naught e to the power and all that then we have n naught on both sides and so we take away the n naughts from there you have one sixteen equals that and you want to take away the negative exponent so 1 over 16 equals 1 over that. When you cross multiply, you get this. Very good. You find natural log of both sides, and you're going to get t equals natural log of 16 on lambda, and you get that. Now, there is another way that I can show you, which is quite uh, shorter, so that uh, maybe another time you can choose to go that way and you are good to go. So let's look at what I have to pro offer, but it's going to give us the same answer. We know number of this. So if you say number of this should be small n, small n, then we have n is equal to the time taking, which is maybe small t over the half-life, which is t half. So it means that if we want t, then you get n times t half. Then how do we find n? Just have to look through that one. We have capital N on n naught will give you 1 over 2 to the power n. So 1 on 16 will give us 1 on 2 to the power n. I can write the 16 to, to be 2 to the power 4, right? So we can say 1 on 2 to the power 4 equals 1 on 2 to the power n. So if you compare left-hand side to the right-hand side, and it means that our n is equal to 4. It's equal to in that case, t becomes 4 times 3.80, and that will give us 15.2 this. <laughs> I love what you are doing. You don't just have a static way of doing it. You can change the way of doing it, and you arrive at the same answer. So this is also a way that we could find the time it would take radon to decay to one sixteenth of the original value. You go through that and then you will get the answer. So Joseph did a very good job. He got us the right destination. He gave a nice explanation as to how or why it should be so. And that's a good one there. Then we go ahead to look at the next question which I want to just throw a little more light on. I'm sure my producer will get in touch with Joseph. He has to be rewarded for a human's job done. Okay. He really did well, and I think he deserves an applause for that. We are proud of you. You have been a very consistent viewer, and we wish you all the best. We wish you all the best. Okay. So we go on. And we've given this as our next question. And we were asked to write an equation. So we're given this table, right? And then we are asked to write a balanced equation for the reaction. And just to give us that balanced equation, it says, a nucleus of hydrogen 3 is formed when, so that's the product. They have a neutron, it's absorbed by nucleus of hydrogen 2. So he gave us hydrogen 2, this 2, H1, plus he gave us that of a neutron, 1, 0. So this neutron is absorbed by this hydrogen, and it's giving us hydrogen 3. So 3, 1, H. Of course, there will be the release of energy. Or you could say the release of, you can bring a particle that will be released there. Okay, but I think energy is okay, it's fine. Then we went ahead to 
we're asked to find the energy released in this reaction. And very importantly, we are looking at Einstein's mass energy equation. Now, I like it when you say E is equal to change in M, because in this case, it is not just the mass, but it is the mass defect. What is mass defect? The difference in the mass of the whole atom and the mass of the constituents of the nucleus of the atom. So if I pick the whole atom made of the nucleus has got protons, neutrons. If I take the individual masses, okay, maybe proton, maybe neutron, then I add. Then I get the whole mass when they are intact, protons, neutrons intact in the atom. There is, according to Einstein, there is or there will be a change in mass. Some of the mass could change or be transformed into energy. Or if you are putting protons, neutrons together to form a nucleus, at the end of the day, if you pick, let's say, one gram of proton, two grams of neutrons, you put them together, you have to get three grams of the nucleus. But when you weigh, you realize that the nucleus will not be three grams, that it will, be, it will fall short of some value. Why? Some energy will, or some of the mass will be transformed into energy as you put them together. That difference between the individual masses, they are some, and the mass of the total nucleus, that difference is the mass defect. So you have to find the mass defect. And he did just that. From the equation we wrote here, this, these are our reactants. So hydrogen 2 and neutron. And then you have to find these ones. They are mass, hydrogen 2 and a neutron. Then this is, oh, good. Hydrogen 3, this is the product formed. So you find its mass 2. That's this one. And they, they've given us the values in the table. So you pick the values, you add this to that and minus that. And that gives us the mass defect. In atomic mass units and you multiply to get it in kilograms then you just put it in the formula change in mass times c squared and perfect two so thank you joseph let's go on briskly and look at what we have left then we would be calling it an evening okay so let's move ahead very soon we will be able to look at some few things then we can call it an evening Okay, so we are going to look at, we're looking at stationary states of the atom. We are done with the problem of the day, and I'm happy we've been able to do that for tonight. It's very important. Good. So I have just some few things to look at. Then we will be ending the revision show for this evening. Okay, good. So I was at the ground state. I was at the ground state. And we are saying at the ground state, we are saying it's the most stable state of the atom. The ground state is the most stable state of the atom. We have this state, an electron will occupy an orbital whose quantum number n is equal to 1. Now the atom at that ground state has the lowest energy. Now, ground state energy. The energy of state of an electron in an atom at the ground state. That's very simple. Once the atom is at the ground state, the electron there will have the ground state energy. Now, something interesting also happens. Excited states. Now, you used, we were having an electron at ground state. Now, if the electron is able to gain energy, higher than the energy is supposed to have at the ground state, then it means that the atom itself has also gained some energy, and the electron picked up some energy. So, the state where an atom possesses energy greater than the minimum energy of an atom at the ground state, we say the atom is in the excited state. So, at that state, the energy of the atom is higher than its energy at the ground state. Therefore, the energy of the electrons in that atom there also, or the electrons of that atom there, will also be higher than the energy at the ground state. What happens when they gain energy from the ground state and they become excited, they move to that excited state, then they make transitions. Very important.
transitions. So this electron that has gained a higher energy is said to be excited. Not that it is happy, but it has gained a higher energy. Now, how do we excite an atom? That is something that you look at. For. How do I excite an atom? Apart from bombarding it with radiations, what else can we do to excite an atom? Now, we are saying that excitation is the movement of electrons from the ground state to any other energy level. The movement of an electron from the ground state to any other energy level. The energy that is required so that we will raise the state of an atom from the ground state to a high energy level is called the excitation energy. That is to say, the energy I will need to excite the atom becomes what we call the excitation energy. Good. Note that at the first excited state hmm, of an electron, n is equal to 2. This is very important. Students usually make this mistake. Before the atom gets excited, it will be at the ground state. We have just looked at it that an electron at the ground state will occupy an orbital with quantum number n equal to 1. So it's already at n equals 1. When it gets excited for the first time, then it will now move from n equals 1 to n equals 2. So at the first state of excitation, its quantum number n becomes 2 and not 1. Then at the second state of excitation, its quantum number becomes 3 and not 2. So be very careful when you are giving the question you are supposed to find something about an electron that has been what excited. So we are saying note it that at the first excited state of an electron, n is equal to 2. Why? This is because before the electron gets excited, it would be at the ground state. And at that place, the quantum number n is already equal to 1. Good. We continue with the technologies. Ionization. When do we say uh, there's an ionization of the atom or we have ionized the atom? When we pick up an electron from the atom and take notes here. Here it should be at the ground state to infinity. So you have an atom at the ground state. You pick up an electron from the atom at the ground state to infinity. Like as if you have thrown it away, something like that. Take it away to infinity. We say that you have ionized the atom or there is ionization. Now, what if, what if it is not at the ground state? We will look at it later on in a GFE. Now, the energy required to move that electron from the atom at the ground state to infinity is called ionization energy. So when you are asked to uh, calculate the ionization energy. It means that indirectly you should know that we are picking an electron from the ground state. Boom. And it goes one. Then take it away to infinity. So you can look at a diagram and you take a transition from ground state and it goes one and you move to infinity. Then you calculate the energy there. Good. Then you look at binding energy. Now we are looking at an electron is in a different state, any other state apart from the ground state. So I have an electron at any other state apart from the ground state. We pick it from there and take it to infinity. In that case, the energy needed to do that, to pick an electron from any other stationary state apart from the ground state to infinity becomes the binding energy. Now, take note of this binding energy of an atom. This is different from binding energy of a nucleus, which is in nuclear physics. So, binding energy of an atom here, I have an electron in the atom at any stationary state apart from the ground state. And I pick it out away to infinity. But binding energy of a nucleus, they are looking at the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. So the, the minimum energy that you need 
to separate the protons and the neutrons of the nucleus becomes burning energy of the nucleus or the energy you need to put the protons and the neutrons of the nucleus together to form a nucleus becomes also the binding energy of the nucleus. So take note as you prepare for the exams, difference between binding energy of an atom and binding energy of the nucleus. Good. Let's look at this example. We are told that the energy of the ground state of a hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 electron volts. And then we are asked to calculate the energy associated with the third energy level. Now, this is something that we are supposed to do. And you have to take your time and work it out and work it well. How do we solve this question? How do you solve this question? So let us look at how we go about it. And you have been given A, B, C, and D. You can call in. I'm sure Shakina is watching still. I'm sure Yusuf is watching still. You can call in and let's share ideas. What will be our answer? And how did you get your answer? Very soon we'll be ending the revision show for tonight. So maybe this will be, may be our last question. Or if I was to answer it briskly, we'll move on to the next question. So we are told that the energy of the ground state of a hydrogen atom is minus 30.6 electron volts. We are asked to calculate the energy associated with the third energy level. Very important. What will be the energy of the third energy level? Let's see. Will it, will it be A, minus 4.5 electron volts? Will it be B, minus 1.51 1 electron volts? Will it be C, plus 4.53 electron volts? Or D, plus 4.0.80? electron volts. How do we go about this question? We have to look at what is our formula for the energy of the hydrogen atom. What is it? It says En is equal to minus 13.6 electron volts all on N squared. So you see, you have to keep this with you. But it's just a question. We're not giving anything. So you have to keep this with you. Now, we are stored energy generated with a third energy level. So we mean that N here becomes 3. So En becomes minus 13.6 EV on 3 squared. And if we evaluate that, that should give us minus. 1.51 electron volts. In that case, our answer will be B. So this is also a past question. So you have to note this expression down that for the hydrogen atom, the energy associated with any level is given as minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. So if it is the first level, n becomes 1. If it is second, n equals 2. If it is still like this one, n becomes 3. n becomes 3. Let's try our hands on the next question as we try to wrap up. I am sure tonight you've been able to re do a recap on atomic and nuclear physics. And I'm glad that all of you who phoned in had a very good understanding of the topic. So we are wrapping up shortly, pretty shortly. And thank you for having us in your homes. Take this question and try your hands on. When we meet again at that time, you could let us have what you got. So when it comes to revision for this year's WASI Doyle Learning Television, we got you covered. Stay glued to your sets. Watch out on social media for our adverts which subjects will come on which day and be part of the revision exercise. I am glad that you stayed with me. We are proud to have our viewers contribute and get the right answers. So until we meet again, keep doing all you have to do to pass and pass well and be consistent. And next be Albert is my name. You can call me Pius and I will say have a good night, take care of yourselves and be good. Bye-bye for now.